sorry. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for Family Ill Preservation Clinic. I am Alicia Nottingham, Assistant Library Conservator at the Preservation and Conservation Laboratory, Heritage Library Division, Nallis. We ask that you keep your cameras off and your mics muted. You are invited to type your questions into the chat for the question and answer segment at the end of this webinar. Let me introduce you to the facilitator today for today's web webinar, Daniel Fraser. Since 2009, Daniel has been the library conservator and head of the PAC lab. Daniel holds a master's of science in information studies and a certificate of advanced studies in conservation of library and archival materials from the University of Texas at Austin. She was a 2008 conservation fellow of the Library of Congress, Washington, D.C. She has been a member of the American Institute for Conservation and the Library Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Daniel enjoyed presenting papers at the annual meetings of regional associations, including Acural and Coral. I know she's looking forward to presenting today for today's webinar. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you, Alicia. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so very much for joining us uh, at this month's clinic. Before we get into the care of CDs and DVDs, let me share a bit about our organization, the National Library and Information System Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, NALIS, is the country's coordinator of all information and library services. Beyond the Heritage Library, there are over 25 public libraries, three libraries in correctional institutions, libraries in secondary schools and primary schools, as well as special libraries in several government agencies, all administered by NALIS. I encourage you to visit our website, www.nalis.gov.tt for more information about our services. We'll post the link in the chat of this webinar. One of NALIS's key responsibilities is to promote and preserve national heritage information. Though the National Library in of itself has a comprehensive collection of paper-based items and electronic audiovisual media, there is particular emphasis on materials with national and Caribbean origin, focus, and authorship. The Heritage Library Division, located on the second floor of the National Library Building, Port of Spain, Trinidad, helps NALIS fulfill the goal of acquiring, promoting, and preserving national heritage information. I invite you to follow the Heritage Library Division on Facebook at NALIS HLDTT. See the link in the chat. Special collections acquired or donated to the Heritage Library Division consist of mainly traditional library items created by or of interest to a significant person or organization of Trinidad and Tobago. One would not be surprised to find within these collections books, newspapers, pamphlets, maps, uh, photographs, letters, film and audio recordings, However, within several collections housed in the Rare Book Room of the National Library, there is a mix of items often labeled memorabilia. So in a sense, we are focused on the preservation of the collective heirlooms of our Trinbagonian family. The Preservation and Conservation Laboratory is responsible for ensuring the overall longevity of library materials, with attention to the Heritage Library Division and its collection of historical importance. The PAC Lab, which was officially commissioned in 2013, helps NALIS fulfill its role as the International Federation of Library Association and Institutions, Preservation and Conservation, or IFLA PAC, Regional Center for the English-Speaking Caribbean. Additionally, this arm of Heritage Library Division advises public and private organizations on the care of their collections and artifacts. The PAC Lab 
has been serving the preservation and conservation needs of clients through fumigation, phrase drying, conservation treatments, collection repair, boundary services, disaster recovery, technical assistance, and preservation training. We miss carrying out our preservation clinics, tours, and training sessions in person. However, we are happy that technology allows us to continue this mission through this preservation webinar series. So we're going to get into the care of CDs and DVDs, but just a few questions as we begin. How many of you actually own CDs and DVDs? And we're gonna start with our very first poll. So how many of you actually own CDs or DVDs? And is it that you have several, just a few, that you don't have CDs anymore or possibly that you never owned. Maybe you're just here out of curiosity. How many of you actually own CDs and DVDs? Right, so you're entering your response in our poll that's up on the screen. Great, let us share the results. And we see that 50% of you have actually said that you own just a few. All right. Interesting. So for those of you who actually own CDs, I want to hear what is actually on your CDs. So we want launching another poll. So the CDs that you have, what do you have stored on your CDs? Is it mainly commercial music or movies? Do you have homemade or unique recordings? Do you just have files and documents? Uh, is it for data backing up? Um, or perhaps digital photographs and scans are on your CDs? Do you have software? And you can select multiple in this case. It's a multiple choice where you can select different options, the ones that are valid for you. Excellent. So a majority of you have commercial music or movies contained on your CDs and DVDs. And just a few under that would have digital photographs and scans, and you also use it for files and documents. So thank you so much for that. So we think of the preservation of our CDs and DVD collections because we have a few in our own collections and they do have some unique and sometimes very important nostalgic information on them. So first we're gonna look at the types and the structures of optical disc. Then we'll share some tips for handling, cleaning and storage of the CDs and DVDs. So let's begin. So back again to our polls. I want to find out, testing your knowledge a little bit, what does the term CD and DVD actually mean? So you are entering your answer in the poll. What does CD stand for and what does DVD stand for? Do you know, do you have a sense? Is CD compact disc, commercial disc or composite disc? And does DVD stand for divided video disc or digital video disc or digital versatile disc? Or maybe it's digital virtual disc. You know, there's so many ways that these acronyms could be put together. Let me see if I could test your knowledge. Great. So we see here that 88% of you said CD stands for compact disc. And same 88% said that it stands for digital 
video disk. So let's see. CD, you are right, is short for compact disk. While DVD first stood for digital video disc, so you were correct, but then it became known for digital versatile disc. And now we just kind of use the term DVD. It doesn't really stand for much beyond that anymore. So both CDs and DVDs are optical media, meaning that light, more exactly a laser, uh, is used for the data retrieval. So let me show you a quick video of how these work with our computers and our playback machines. Information in a computer is stored as thousands of zeros and ones called bits. On a CD-ROM, bits are represented by microscopic holes and bumps called pits and lands. When a laser beam is reflected off of these tiny hills and valleys into a photodiode, they turn into an electrical pulse that a computer recognizes as a stream of zeros and ones, thus recreating words, images, and sounds. Great. So we understand that by optical, it means that it's using a laser for us to actually read the uh, information off of the disk. And it's engraved into layers on the CD, on the optical disk, in a way that it has bumps or valleys. And those will be read by the computer's um, sensor and gives out the information, either audio, video, our text, our documents, our files, etc. Now, ROM that you see here for CD-ROM or DVD-ROM stands for read-only media. And these discs are non-recordable. They're coming straight from the manufacturer with the recordings already made in them and you cannot erase them. You cannot record anything new on them. However, CD-R or DVD-R or DVD-R um, plus R are actually recordable, but they're not erasable, meaning that you can only record on them once. CDRW uh, or CDR RAM or um, DVDR RAM or DVDRW are the ones that are rewritable. So that means you can actually record on them and erase over and over again. Now there's one other high definition optical disc format that you may be familiar with, and that's Blu-ray. However, considering widespread root use, this webinar is generally gonna be focused just on DVDs and CDs. So DVDs and CDs are layered and they comprise of the same type of materials, but they have different functionalities. So you can think of an optical disc as a sandwich of different layers and the materials are laminated together into one single structure. And the thing about it is that over time, since our CDs and DVDs came on the market in the 90s, they have different formulations that may not be um, public different chemicals have been used, different structures, etc., based on who's manufacturing it. But we can take a, a look and understand some of the basic layers. So regardless of who's manufacturing it, these tend to be the layers that you may find in an optical disc. So there is the label, uh, which is the printable surface at the top part of the disc. Then we have the reflective layer right below the label. And this layer helps with the optics for the readability and the recordability of the disc. Remember we said that a laser is used in order to help us read. 
It's this reflective layer that helps bounce back the light that's transmitted uh, from the recording or the data layer to the sensor on the disk drive. Now, it's important that that layer is bounced back down into the sensor rather than scattered further because that's how the information is actually read. Now, this reflective layer tends to be a range of metals. You can have aluminum, gold, silver, or even a silver alloy. Then there's the recording or data layer. That layer uh, can be a layer of um, aluminum, gold, silver, or silver alloy, but you can also have silicone as well as organic dyes. Now, the most durable of this re recording or data layer is gold. On this layer, the data is recorded, like you saw in that video, in those marks and pits, you know, those valleys and um, hills, which would either absorb light from the laser beam or transmit that light back to a sensor in your disk drive. And then at the base, you have the polycarbonate substrate, which is a tough thermoplastic layer that actually helps to keep the disk flat and stable. It is transparent, so it allows the light beams to actually pass through from the laser without being deflected. Now, all optical discs would have all of these, or perhaps a combination of these basic layers. And so we can think about what happens in the difference between CDs and DVDs. Now, CDs can be uh, written only on one side, so they have only one recorded layer. However, DVDs can be written on both sides or recorded on both sides, so they actually have two recorded layers. So if you take a look at just this sort of graphical breakdown of the layers of a CD, the one that's a CD-ROM, so it's coming to you already recorded, it has uh, the label, then it has the lacquer, there's a metal uh, setting, and then the polycarbonate. The DVDs, on the other hand, have a combination of more layers depending on whether or not it's a one-sided or a two-sided DVD. Now, for recordable or rewritable CDs and DVDs, you have even more layers, and those can be even more duplicated. So note, however, here, that the double-sided DVD has two recordable layers sandwiched and layered together. So we have one layer here, recording, writing layer, and then down below we have another one that's sandwiched together with the center adhesive. So you can almost think of a DVD as having two slender CDs glued together by that center adhesive. So we understand that optical discs are composite items. However, because of that, each layer is susceptible to different types of deterioration and harm. Now, anything that would block the laser beam from focusing on the data layer would prevent the optical disc from being used effectively. So most read-only discs are made with aluminum in their reflective layer. This metal, unfortunately, is susceptible to oxidation, especially if it's kept in a humid and hot environment. Now, oxidation, just to break it down really simply, is a reaction with oxygen. And in this case, what happens with the aluminum is that it loses that reflectability, that um, reflectivity, that shininess is lost. And this is called disrot. And I want to just very quickly show you a couple of CDs and maybe you've seen this over time. This rut sometimes gets to be misunderstood as being called mold because it has that sort of resemblance, that patchiness, those wrong circles, the, the dark color, etc. But it is not an organic invasion. It's actually a chemical reaction that has caused this to happen. At this point, your CD is inoperable. And you can also have this sort of vulnerability happening as well with another metal, which would be the silver. If silver is used instead of aluminum, you can still have some reactions going on. Silver can react with 
environmental pollutants in order to become corroded. And so again, it's going to lose that shininess and therefore not allow the CD to be operable. So you see here that this reflective layer, layer is very vulnerable to oxidation and to poor environmental conditions. The recording layer, however, is sometimes made up of the exact same material. And so it is also vulnerable to that oxidation if they're the metals that we're talking about. But the recording layer also has some photosensitive dyes and those dyes over time can degrade just naturally. And then the, the rest of the components in the disc do not deteriorate as quickly, uh, sorry, don't, don't stay as good as the polycarbonate substrate. However, this, even though it's plastic and it's not as vulnerable to any of the oxidation and those sort of reactions, it is vulnerable to poor handling. So our fingerprints, our smudges, scratches, dust, solvents, those sort of things could prevent the laser from properly reading the data layer, as well as if you have it stored in high temperature and humidity, it can actually cause this to warp, uh, the polycarbonate to warp. And the disc has to be flat in order to be read by the laser. So ensuring that these things are available while we maintain its integrity, particularly when we have to regularly handle them, that's going to be one of the things we think about in preserving and ensuring that we can continue using our CDs and DVDs. It's important to note that direct contact and anything that affects the polycarbonate material that could result in the laser being unable to correctly read the data would be something that you want to avoid. So with that in mind, here are a couple of tips for handling optical discs. You want to be sure to handle your CDs and DVDs only on the outer edges. Do not touch the surface of the disc. So I have here with me, uh, CD, and I want you to note that I'm actually using my fingers just on the outside. Or you can handle it from the hub at the center, the plastic hub. Any touches or any damage that goes on to this area of the CD can potentially damage it because that is where we have the information stored. So you do not want to actually touch the surface of the disc at all. Now, occasional scratches would have little to no effect. However, if you have multiple deep scratches, that can actually make a disc unreadable where you cannot use it again. And especially if the damage gets all the way down into the recording layers, that's going to be permanent. Now, we want to label our CDs on the layer level, on the layer that's um, designated for labeling. However, what you use is going to be very important. You want to be sure to use a non-solvent felt tip permanent marker. Do not use boil point pens, pencils, or fine tips markers because those can actually cause scratches in the label layer. Now for a CD particularly, not so much more DVD because a DVD has those extra layers, but for a CD in particularly, when you damage the layer that is for labeling, you can very easily damage the reflective layer because that's close together. They're right on top of each other. And once you have scratches in that reflective layer, that's going to prevent, again, remember, we want to ensure that that layer remains very nice and reflective to help bounce back the laser as it's being read. So you want to be sure that you're not scratching the label layer as well. Now, the thing about it, those scratches can actually expose the layers underneath to the damaging effects that we heard about for the environmental um, elements. So for instance, you then expose it to high humidity, 
the high temperature, the pollutants that can cause that disrupt and those um, corrosion and those other things happening to the metal layer that's sandwiched in between. Now, if you plan to store your disc beyond five years, you should not use adhesive labels. Though adhesive labels, we think of it and we say, well, okay, they provide additional protection. We won't be having to write anything on the surface itself. They can eventually age and cause some problems as it gets to be affected by heat and moisture. It can even cause this to now be unbalanced as it's being spun in the drive. And so it affects the readability of the disc down the road. Now, regular cleaning of CDs and DVDs is unnecessary, right? You don't have to say to yourself, okay, the same way I'm cleaning my house every, however often I have to go through and clean your CDs and DVDs. That should be unnecessary. As best as possible, you want to keep dirt and other contaminants away from your optical disc. So it should be best practice to do the cleaning only when it's required. So let me know in the poll, we have one more poll for you. Which cleaner do you believe would be safest for us to use on our CDs and DVDs? Is it gonna be this dish detergent should we use a glass or window cleaner? I mean, we want it to shine, we want it to be polished. Should we use acetone? Or do we use isopropyl alcohol? What do you think? Enter your response in the poll, make your selection there. Which one of these do you think is safe for cleaning our optical disc? Right, let's see the results. 53% of you said isopropyl alcohol. Great. Let's see. Now, generally, cleaners on a whole should be avoided. Those very harsh cleaners should be avoided. So even if it's organic. So those that contain acetone, that's a no. Uh, benzene, um, you know, I don't want to call any brand names, but those general cleaners that we use on household items are not to be used on disc because they can actually cause irreversible, irreparable damage. Now, the milder solvents like isopropyl alcohol and methanol could be used because they quickly evaporate. They're not going to remain and uh, keep the disc wet. So they quickly evaporate off and so they can be used uh, in a very good way. Though it may be best, and I recommend this, that it may be best to use a cleaning detergent that's formulated for cleaning CDs and DVDs, right? So one that's actually designed for cleaning and um, those optical discs might be the best option if you have to go about cleaning. Now, please note and remember that every time a disc is actually wiped or clean, you are putting it at risk for damage. Right, so there should be, uh, it, there should be that consideration. Do you have to clean it? And therefore, it's better that you choose to clean, moving from the least invasive to the most invasive. So it's recommended that you start with an air puffer first. Right, something that just blows air, blows off the particles of dust on the surface of the DVD and then use a soft cotton cloth or a chamois. At first, use it dry and then use it with those safe cleaning solutions, right? The solutions that are formulated for CDs or DVDs or isopropyl alcohol and methanol. Now, when cleaning the disc, any form of paper material should not be used, no matter how soft the paper is. Even if it's lens paper, that should not be used because that can actually cause scratches on the surface of the CD. Now, did you know that the direction of the cleaning is very important? I want you to answer in the poll. Which is best for wiping? How do you go about wiping your CD and DVD? And I have with me a little 
This is actually just a, a plastic that comes with your CDRs. So do you want to wipe in a wide circular motion like this? Or do you want to do small circular moves? Or should it be a straight line out from the center of the disc towards the edge? Which do you think would be the best motion for cleaning your optical disc? Let's see the results. Right? Wow, we actually have a tie here. 36% and 36% said, and we have a tone here that you use wide circular motions in the direction going around the disc in that spiral direction. And then the other set of you said that you should use straight lines from the center of the disc. Let's see who's correct. You do not want to wipe in that circular motion. You want to start cleaning from the middle with your soft cloth from the middle going out in a straight line towards the edge, right? And again, it's not a back and forth, up and down from the edge to the middle, but it's always from the middle out to the edge. And that's the least damaging way for dealing with a soft cloth trying it first dry to see if we can remove the dirt that way first, and then using solutions, then you can move very gently from the center, moving out. Now, if the disc that you have is really dirty, like there's something, you know, that's not wiping away, it's not coming out for the air, it looks like it's really embedded, you can try rinsing it first with some water, Right? This should be as clean as possible a water that you can get. Very quickly, just rinsing it with some water and seeing if that heavy dirt will come off that way. But again, trying first with your cloth that's dry and moving from the inside all the way to the edge, from the middle, from the center to the outer edge. Right? Good job. Now, it's recommended that your optical disc are stored in individual storage containers, ideally. These cases help to protect the disc from contaminants and pollutants in the air, and also they help keep them stable when the environmental conditions are fluctuating. So the best storage containers for CDs and DVDs are the ones that protect the polycarbonate substrate of the disc from touching the interior of the enclosure. Now, this should be stored individually, that is one disc per hub, and they should be stored upright in these cases. Now, one example, and this is the only one I could find at home that didn't have any decorative material on the outside, would be these jewel cases. I'm sure we're pretty familiar with them. They come in a variety of types. Sometimes they can house, house just one CD like this one here, or perhaps up to six CDs. And they're usually clear like this one that you see here. So there's a tray along with the um, cover, which you would open. And once you take out, take off the cover, you see that the CD is actually on a hub that you would have to press down in order to pull out the CD. So ideally, it will be in here where the CD itself is just hanging on the hub and you ought to store it vertically as you would a book on a shelf, right? You should not in long term store CDs flat and stack them on top of each other. It's better for them to be stored vertically like you would uh, a book style. Now, there's also the option of a slim line case and I don't have one here, but it's a slimmer version of a jewel case that just doesn't have the, uh, the backing tray, but it does still have those um, hub supports, et cetera. Now, when we think of storage of CDs and DVDs, we could think of two options. If you're storing them in the short term, the temperature ought not to be any higher than 20 degrees Celsius and the relative humidity should be stable anywhere within the range of 20 to 50% RH, 
right? Relative humidity refers to the amount of moisture in the air. However, if you're looking at long-term storage or what might be considered archival storage, that temperature should be cooler at 18 degrees Celsius and the relative humidity should be drier at that 40% RH. So we wanted dry conditions where there's not a lot of moisture and cooler temperatures to ensure that we keep those CDs and DVDs for as long as possible, that we reduce the chances of some of those deterioration uh, things happening as we have our CDs stored. Now there's one thing I want to give some special consideration to, and that would be, you've probably heard of it, gold CDs. Now what is meant by gold CDs? There literally is gold used on the inside of them. So they have gold as their reflective layer instead of the aluminum. Now these are called archival quality CDs, and a lot of manufacturers actually claim that they can last up to 100 years. However, that claim is based on, um, you know, them running theoretical tests in laboratories or using artificial aging, etc. So we don't know for sure, but we do hope that they are able to last long, as long as that. So this is the archival standard for CDs. That is the gold CD. So you'll find that, for instance, at the Heritage Library, all of our original content the content that we would have garnered via our um, performing arts and genealogy oral history unit, the one that goes out and records audio, records video, um, videos, etc. Yes, we have them saved on a digital server as digital files, but we ought to also be backing them up. If we are doing that backing up on CDs, the choice of CDs should be the gold CDs, right? So this is your choice if you're looking at storing to an, an archival standard. Right, so I thank you for attending our Family Heirloom Preservation Clinic this month. Feel free to put your questions in the chat or to email me. You should see in the chat a link for downloading the resource list. Uh, that link remains available until July 7th. So I encourage you to go to that link and download the PDF of the webinar resources. You will receive today a brief survey and your feedback is going to be important to us. So we look forward to your responses. Be sure to register for our upcoming webinars. I am so excited to invite you to join us for our Pack Lab anniversary special on July 14th. It's at 1 p.m. local time. I want you to join Pack Lab staff as we take a commemorative look back at events and activities since our commissioning of lab in 2013. So the registration link would be in the chat and I hope that you join us to celebrate in July. So we go now to your questions. questions, comments? Uh, do you wish for us to explore a different topic? Is there something that you might be interested in hearing us take a look at, give some advice on? It does not have to be on CDs and DVDs. I do hope that you uh, take the information and that it helps with those collections, but any general questions will be welcomed. So I see here a question from one person who says, hi, how to restore LP records? And that's a really interesting one. Uh, I know that quite a number of us, uh, maybe more so our parents, may have had LPs. Uh, just for everyone, those are long playing records. They're usually black and they tend to be um, a lot bigger than a, a CD, but in a sense, almost the same sort of thing where um, the information is grooved into the surface of the CD. So instead of a computer reading it, what you would have is a needle that does the reading of those bumps and jumps, and that's converted into an audio sound. Now, with respect to its restoration, that's a little way out of my um, training. Uh, 
we can give some advice on that and perhaps that's something that we can look into. The aspect of dealing with LPs, again, you ought not, to, because that's where the information is, you ought not to be touching, just pretend this is an LP for a moment, you ought not to be touching the surface of the, um, of the record itself uh, in order to prevent scratches and the glues, etc. And any cleaning that you're doing, unlike the CD, where we would have cleaned from the center going out in that direction, this time though for uh, LP, I believe it's better for you to clean in the direction of the grooves because you don't want to cause the damage that goes on there. You want to use something that's very soft, right? Uh, with respect to solutions, I am not sure and I don't want to um, mention anything just yet without taking a further look into it. So we can get back to you on those details, but definitely it's a, it's an interesting one. I know music on a whole has evolved in such an amazing way where we would have first had, um, even before LPs, we would have had some earlier formats moving to the LPs. Then we have tape, you know, cassette tape, um, reel to reel tape. Then we would have moved into CDs and now we're into digital media. So that aspect of how do we go about saving all of it, that's a really good topic that perhaps we can look into a little bit more detail, inviting someone else with that expertise to chime in and give some advice on that. There's another one, um, one second. There's another question here. Um, is there, is there any possible solution to remove scratches? I want to believe from CDs. Right. With respect to CDs, I, I did not look into... Online, there are several vendors who would claim that they have solutions uh, for that. However, from the reputable sources that we would have in our webinar resource document that is in the link in the chat that you should download and... Um, take a read through. That document, uh, those resources shied away and kind of kept away from naming any particular solution that you would actually add to the surface of a CD. Um, I think probably because of the fact that the layers on the inside of a CD are so vulnerable to some of the um, pollutants, to the environmental conditions, etc., that now adding a chemical especially if it's one that's not tested, it could be difficult and it could cause some inadverse problems. So I am not, I'm going to step away and not name any particular solution from that. Um, again, if it's something that you're very desperate to have restored, it may make sense to um, give some, seek some advice from an audio technician who may be able to with their professional opinion, give some advice on that further. I see a comment uh, with respect to LPs. And yes, that is true. You do have to worry about them warping, especially as we're in the Caribbean and we're dealing with um, higher temperatures, warmer conditions. Uh, Cause if they're sitting down uh, in those conditions, they can be warped just because of the plastics that they're made of. And once you have that, that change in shape, just like for a CD, once you have that change in shape, that can affect the reading of it or the playback of it. So same way with an LP, it playing on that record and, and getting that feedback um, from the record player. If it's warped, you have some difficulty there. Likewise, with the CDs, I know uh, a lot of us may have had CDs in our vehicles when we had CD players and we may have left a CD on the dashboard, have it exposed to that extreme sunlight um, and that higher temperature. Those are things that can cause a lot of irreversible damage to our, um, see our optical disc, right? Because again, it warps the polycarbonate substrate and once that is warped, it prevents the optical disc from being read properly in our disc drives. I don't see any more questions so far. Great. Thank you so much, Alicia. 
Thank you so very much, everyone. I look forward to seeing you at our anniversary special, July 14th. I am so excited for us to celebrate this in a virtual way. Um, it's um, going to be interesting to walk down memory lane and actually see some of the things we've been involved with and also the opportunity to hear from more than just me. So it's going to be Pack Lab staff, uh, not all 15 of us, well, 14 of us, but just a selection who would be speaking on their experiences, some of their memories, etc., as it relates to uh, the journey that we've gone through. So I encourage you to join us. I look forward to your celebrating with us on July 14th. So everyone, please do remain safe. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for joining us.